Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit East 2017, brought to you by Databricks. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Boston, everybody. Nick Pentreath is here. He's a principal engineer at the IBM Spark Technology Center in South Africa. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Great to see Great you. To so, be here. Uh, so let's see, it's a little different time of year here that you're, you're used to, but. Uh. <laughs> I've flown from, uh, I don't know the Fahrenheit equivalent, but uh, 30 degrees Celsius heat and, and sunshine yeah, yeah. So it's, it's snow and sleet. A lot so. chillier there, <laughs> wait, till, wait till tomorrow. But, uh, so I, as I was joking, you probably get the t-shirt for the longest flight here, so yeah, uh, yeah. welcome. I, I actually need the, 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 the parka or like <laughs> yeah, a, a, a beanie. Yeah, a little better, <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. long sleeve. So Nick, tell us about uh, the Spark Technology Center, STC is its sort of acronym and, and your role there. Sure, yeah, thank you. So Spark Technology Center was, uh, was formed by IBM um, a little over a year ago. And its mission is to, to focus on the open source world, particularly Apache Spark and, and the ecosystem around that, and to really uh, drive forward the, the community uh, and make contributions to uh, both the core project and the ecosystem. Um, the overarching goal is to, to help drive adoption, uh, and particularly in enterprise customers, uh, the kind of customers that IBM typically serves, uh, and to, to, uh, to harden Spark and to make it really enterprise ready. So why, why Spark? I mean, we've watched IBM do this now for, for several years. We, we, you know, the, the famous example that I like to use is Linux. When IBM put a you know, billion dollars in, into Linux and it, it really went all in on, on open source and it drove a lot of IBM you know, value both internally and externally for customers. So what was it about Spark? I mean, you could have made a similar bet on Hadoop. You decided not to. You sort of waited to see the market evolve. What was the catalyst for having you guys go all in on Spark? Yeah, um, good question. I mean, I, I, I don't know uh, all the details of certainly uh, of what, what was the, you know, the internal drivers because uh, I joined STC a, a, little, a little under a year ago, so you know, I'm fairly new. Translate um, the hallway talk, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, it, essentially, you know, I think you, you raise very good um, uh, parallels to, to Linux and, and also uh, Java. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so Spark, uh, so IBM made these investments in open source technologies that it, that, um, that it sees to be transformational um, and, and kind of game changing. And I think the, you know, most people will probably admit within IBM that they you know, maybe missed the boat actually on Hadoop uh, and saw Spark as, as the successor. Um, and actually saw a chance to, to really uh, dive into that and, and kind of almost leapfrog um, and say, we're, we're going to back this as the, the next generation uh, analytics platform and operating system for you know, analytics and, and big data in the enterprise. Well, I don't know if you happen to watch the Super Bowl, but there's a saying that it's sometimes better to be lucky than good, and uh, that sort of <laughs> applies. And so, in some respects, maybe missing the window on Hadoop was not a bad thing uh, for IBM because yeah, exactly. not a lot of people made a ton of dough on Hadoop and they're still sort of struggling to figure it out. And now along comes Spark and you've got this more real-time nature. IBM talks a lot about bringing analytics and transactions together. They've made some announcements about that and affecting business outcomes in near real time. I mean, that's really what it's all about. And you're one of your areas of expertise is machine learning. And, and so talk about that relationship and what it means for organizations, your mission, yeah, uh, machine learning is, is a key part of uh, of the mission. Um, you know, and and you, you you've seen uh, the, the kind of big data in enterprise story, uh, starting with with the kind of uh, the Hadoop and data lakes, and you know, and and that's that's evolved into into you know now we, we've before we just dumped all of this data into these you know, these data lakes and these silos, and we, we maybe we had some Hadoop jobs and, and so on. But now we've got all this data that we can store. What are we actually going to do with it? So, so part of that is is you know the traditional uh, data warehousing and, and business intelligence and analytics. But more and more, we're seeing you know th there's a rich uh, value in this data, and to unlock it, you really need uh, intelligent systems. You need to, you need machine learning. You need you know, AI. You need uh, real time decision making that that starts you know transcending the boundaries of old rules based systems and human based systems. Mm -hmm. um, so. We see machine learning as, as one of the key uh, tools and one of the key kind of uh, unlockers of value in, 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 in these enterprise data stores. So um, Nick, perhaps paint us a picture of someone who's advanced enough to be working with machine learning with, with IBM and sort of, we know that the tool chain's kind of immature, although IBM with DataWorks or DataFirst has a fairly broad end-to-end um, -end 
sort of suite of tools, but what sort of what are the early use cases, and then what needs to mature to go into sort of higher higher volume production apps or higher value production apps? Uh, I think the the early use cases for you know, machine learning in general and certainly at scale. Um, are, are numerous and, and they're growing. Um, but classic examples are, um, are let's say, recommendation engines. Um, th that's an, you know, an area that's close to my heart. You know, in my in my previous life before IBM, I, I built a startup that that uh, had a recommendation engine service, um, uh, you know, targeting online uh, stores and e-commerce players and, and uh, social networks and so on. So th this is you know, a great a great kind of example use case. We've got all this data about let's say customer behavior in your your, your, your retail store or your video sharing sites, and um, and in order to serve those customers better uh, and make more money, if you can make good recommendations to them about what they should buy, or what they should watch, or what, you know what they should listen to, you know that's a classic uh, use case for machine learning and unlocking the data that is there. So that is one of the drivers of, of some some of these systems. Um, you know, uh, players like Amazon. Uh, they're, they're sort of good examples of, of the recommendation uh, use case. You know, another is fraud detection, and that, that is a classic example in uh, financial services, uh, enterprise, you know, which, is, which is a kind of staple of, of IBM's customer base. Uh, so th these are the, the, a couple of examples of, of the use cases, um, but the, the tool sets traditionally have been, uh, have been kind of cumbersome. So, yeah, Amazon built everything from scratch themselves using customized systems, um, and they've got teams and teams of people. Nowadays, you know, you've got this built into Apache Spark, you've got it in, in Spark a machine learning library, you've got good models to do that kind of thing. So I think from an algorithmic perspective, there's been a lot of advancement and there's a lot of uh, standardization um, and almost commoditization of, of the, the model side. So what is missing? Yeah, what, you know, and, what else? And, and what, is, uh, what are the shortfalls currently? So. There's a big difference between the, the old, the current view, uh, and I guess the hype of, of, of you know, machine learning, um, as you know, you've got data, you you apply some machine learning, and and then you get profit, right? But really, there's a, there's a huge, hugely complex workflow that involves uh, you know, this end-to-end -end story. You know, you've, got, you've you've got data coming from various data sources. You have to feed it into uh, to one centralized system. Uh, transform and process it, extract your features and do your, your kind of hardcore data science, which is the core piece that everyone sort of thinks about as the only piece. But that's kind of in the middle and it, it makes up a relatively small proportion of, of the overall chain. Then once you've got that, you know, you, you, you do model training and, uh, and selection, uh, testing, and you now have to take that model, uh, that machine learning algorithm, and you need to deploy it into a real system to make real decisions. And that's not even the end of it, because once you've got that, you need to close the loop, what we call the feedback loop, and you need to uh, you need to monitor the performance of that of that model in, in you know, the real world. You need to make sure that it's not deteriorating, that it's adding business value, all of these kind of things. So I think that is the the, the real um, you know the, the the piece of the of the puzzle that's missing at the moment is is this end to end you know, delivering this uh, this end to end story. Um, and doing it uh, at scale, uh, securely, enterprise grade. And the business impact of that presumably will be um, a better, better quality experience. Because, I mean, recommendation engines and fraud detection have been around for a while. They're just not that good. Retargeting systems, you know, are sort of too, too little, too late, and kind of you know, cumbersome fraud detection. Still, a lot of false positives. Getting much better. Certainly, compressing the time. It used to be six months to detect yes, fraud. Yes. Now it's you know, minutes or, or seconds, but, but a lot of false positives still. So, so yeah. are you suggesting that by closing that gap that we'll start to see from a consumer standpoint much better experiences? Well, I think, I think that's imperative because if you don't see that from a consumer standpoint, then, then the, you know, the mission is failing because ultimately the, it's, not a, it's not magic that you, you just simply throw machine learning at, at something and you unlock business value and everyone's happy. You have to, you know, you, you, there's a human in the loop here that you have to uh, fulfill the customer's needs, you have to fulfill consumer needs, and the better you do that, you know, the more successful your business is. So you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the time scale, you know, and I think that's, that's a key piece here. Um, yeah. What makes uh, what makes better decisions? What makes a machine learning system better? Well, uh, it, it's better data uh, and more data, so uh, and faster decisions. So you know, I think all of those three are, are coming into play with with you know Apache Spark, end-to-end uh, you know, -end story streaming systems, and um, you know the, the models are getting, are getting better and better because they're getting more data and better data. So I think we, we've 
the, the industry has pretty much attacked the time problem, certainly for fraud detection and, and recommend, recommendations, this is the, the quality issue. Are we close? I mean, we're talking about six to 12 months before we'll really sort of start to see a, a, a major impact to the consumer and ultimately to the, to the company who's providing those services? Well, or is it further away from th than that, you think? Uh, it, you know, it's always difficult to make predictions about time frames. Um, but I think there's, there's, a, you know, there's, there's a long way to go to go from, yeah, as you mentioned where we are, we, we, you know, the, the algorithms and the models are kind of quite quantitized. The, 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 the time gap to make predictions is kind of down to this real-time nature. Yeah. So, so, so what is missing, I think it's actually, it's, it's less about um, the traditional machine learning algorithms and more about you know, making the systems better, uh, getting better feedback, uh, you know, better monitoring, uh, improving, so improving the, the, the end user experience of these systems. Yeah. And that's actually, you know, it's a, I don't think it's, 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 I think there's a lot of work to be done. I don't think it's a six to 12 month uh, thing necessarily. I don't think that in 12 months suddenly, you know, everything's going to be perfectly recommended. You know, I, I think there's, 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 there's areas of, Active uh, research in you know in, in, in the kind of academic fields about how to improve these things, uh, but I think it's a big engineering uh, challenge to you know, to uh, uh, to bring in more disparate data sources to you know to better uh, to improve data quality to improve these feedback loops to try and you know get systems that are that are you know serving customer needs better so improving recommendations improving the quality of fraud detection systems you know everything from that to medical imaging and cancer detection. I think we've got a long way to go. Would it be fair to say that we've done a pretty good job with um, traditional application uh, life cycle in terms of DevOps, um, but we now need the DevOps for the data scientists and, and their collaborators. Yeah, I and, think that's... Uh, and where is IBM uh, along that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and, and, and I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, you know, that, that the the enterprise applied machine learning problem has, has moved from, from the kind of academic to, uh, to this software engineering and, and actually DevOps. Uh, internally, someone mentioned the word train ops. So it's almost like the, 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 you know, the, the machine learning workflow um, and, and actually productionizing and operationalizing that. So you know, recently, IBM for one has announced uh, Watson Data Platform and now Watson Machine Learning. Um, and that really tries to, you know, uh, to address that problem. So really, the aim is to, to simplify um, and, and productionize these end-to-end -end machine learning workflows. Uh, so that is the, you know, the, the product uh, push that, that IBM has at the moment. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I was at the, uh, the Watson data platform announcement. You call the data works. I think they changed the branding, oh, but yeah. it looked like there were numerous components that IBM had in its portfolio that it's now strung together and to create that end-to-end -end system that, that you're describing. Is that is that a fair characterization, or is it sort of underplaying? <laughs> I'm sure uh, it is the work that went into it, but but maybe help us understand that better. Yeah, I mean, I I should caveat it by saying I'm you know we're fairly focused, uh, very focused at STC on the open source side of things. So my work is predominantly uh, within the Apache Spark project, and I'm less involved in the day-to-day. So you didn't day. contribute specifically to Watson not, Data Platform? Not to the, the product line, so you know, I, I yeah, wouldn't, so it's I wouldn't really want to- Yeah, so not an appropriate question for you. I wouldn't want to you. kind of, uh, yeah. to, 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 you know, to talk too deeply about it yeah, just yeah, simply so that, because I haven't been involved. Yeah, that's, that's that I, don't, I don't want to push you on that because it's not your wheelhouse, but, but then help me understand how you will commercialize the activities that, that you do, or is that not necessarily the intent? So the, 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 in, the intent with STC in particular is that uh, we focus on, on open source, um, and a core part of, of that is that we, you know, being within IBM, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, to interface with other product groups and, and, you know, and customer groups. Right. So while, we, while we're not directly focused on, let's say, the, the commercial aspect, uh, we, we, want to, uh, we want to effectively leverage the ability to talk to you know, real world customers and find out the use cases, uh, talk to all the product groups that are building this Watson data platform and, and all the product uh, lines and, and, and the, the features. Uh, data science experience, you know, it's all built on top of Apache Spark and, and platform. So, so your role is really to innovate. Right? Exactly, and, yeah. And leverage and open source and innovate. Uh, both innovate and, um, and kind of uh, improve. So, you know, improve performance, improve efficiency. Uh, you know, when you're operating at, at a, the scale of a company such as IBM and, and, and other large players, you, 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 you know, your customers and, and you as, a, as, as product teams and, and builders of products, 
uh, will come into uh, into contact with all the kind of little issues and, and bugs and right. performance uh, make it better. problems. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and that is the feedback that we take on board and, mm -hmm. and we try and make it better for, you know, not just for IBM and their customers, but for, because it's, you know, an Apache project, uh, everyone benefits. So that's really the idea, you know, take all the feedback and learnings from uh, enterprise customers and product groups and, you know, centralize that in, in, in the open source contributions that we make. Great. Would it be, um, so would it be fair to say you're focusing on making the core Spark, Spark ML and Spark ML Lib uh, capabilities, sort of the machine learning libraries and then the pipeline more robust? Yes. And, and if that's the case, like we know there needs to be um, like improvements in its ability to serve predictions, uh, pr you know, in real time, like high speed. Um, we know there's a need to take the, the pipeline and sort of share it with other tools perhaps, or you know, collaborate with other tool chains. Um, yeah. What are some of the things that the enterprise customers are looking for along those lines? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a great question and, and you know, very topical at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so both from a, uh, an open source community perspective and from you know, an enterprise customer perspective, this is one of the, if not the key, I, I think, kind of missing pieces that within this Spark machine learning uh, kind of community at the moment. And it's one of the things that comes up most often. Uh, so it is a missing piece and you know, we as a community need to work together and decide, you know, is this something that where uh, we build it within Spark and, and provide that functionality? Uh, is it something where, where we, we adopt, uh, we try and adopt open standards uh, that, that, you know, that will benefit everybody and that and that provides a kind of you know, one one standardized format or, or, you know, uh, or, or way of serving models, you know, or, or is it something where there's a you know, there's a few open source projects out there uh, that that might serve you know, for this purpose, and, and do do we get behind those? So I, I don't have the answer because um, this is ongoing work, um, but it's it's definitely one of the most critical kind of blockers or, or uh, let's say areas that needs work at the moment. One quick uh, question then, along those lines. IBM, the first thing IBM contributed to the Spark community was um, Spark ML, which as I understand it was this, um, uh, it was a, an ability to, uh, I think, create um, an ensemble sort of set of models to do a better job, you know, or more accurate, create so, a more uh, are accurate. Are you referring to system ML? I system think it is. ML, what oh, what did I Yeah, so, so. Um, yeah, where does that fit? System ML uh, started out uh, as a uh, IBM research project, and the, perhaps the simplest way to describe it is, you know, as a as a kind of SQL optimizer is to to take SQL queries and, and then decide how to execute them uh, in the most efficient way. System ML takes a, a kind of high-level mathematical language and compiles it down to uh, you know to an execution plan that runs in a distributed system. So. In much the same way as, as, as your SQL uh, operators, you know, allow this kind of very flexible and high-level language where you don't have to worry about how things are done. You just tell it, tell the system what you want done. System ML aims to do that for uh, for mathematical and machine learning problems. So it's now an Apache project. It's been donated to open source, and it's an incubating project uh, under very active development. And uh, that is really, you know, the, the, there's a couple of different aspects to it, but that's the the, the the high-level goal. The, the underlying execution engine is, is Spark. Uh, it, it, it can run on Hadoop and it can run locally, but you know, really the, the main focus is to execute on Spark um, and then expose these, these kind of higher-level APIs for you know, that are familiar to users of languages like R and Python, for example, uh, to be able to write their algorithms and not necessarily worry about you know, how do I do uh, large-scale matrix uh, operations on a cluster system ML will compile that down and execute it for them. So really quickly, follow up, what that means is it, it's a higher level way for uh, people who aren't sort of cluster aware to write machine learning algorithms that are cluster aware. Precisely, yeah. That's very, very valuable if it, when it works. <laughs> when it works. It, yeah. So it, it, it does, uh, again, with the caveat that I'm, I'm mostly focused on Spark and not so much the system ML side of things. Uh, so I'm definitely not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert in it, um, but it, it does. You know, it, it works at the moment. Uh, it, it, it works for a large class of machine learning problems. It's uh, you know, it's very powerful. 
Um, but again, it, it's a young project and, uh, and you know, there's always work to be done. So exactly the, the areas that, that I, I know that they're focusing on are, are these areas of usability, um, and, you know, hardening up the APIs and making them um, kind of easier to use and, and easier to access for users coming from uh, the R and Python communities who again are, as you said, are, are not they're not necessarily experts on distributed systems and cluster awareness, but they know how to write a, a very complex uh, machine learning, custom machine learning model in R, for example. And it's really trying to enable them uh, with, with a set of uh, API tools. Uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of the, the underlying engine, it's, it's, uh, you know, there are, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands, millions of lines of code and, and years and years of research that's gone into that. So it's an extremely uh, powerful you know, set of tools. But yes, a, a lot of work still, be, still to be done there and, and ongoing to make it, uh, in a way to make it user ready and, and enterprise ready in the sense of you know, uh, making it easier for people to, to use it and adopt it and, and to put it into, into their systems and production. So I wonder if we could close, uh, Nick, just a few questions on STC. So, so the Spark Technology Center is in Cape Town is a, is that a global expertise center? Is, it a, is, is STC a virtual sort of in, uh, IBM community? Or? I, I'm the only member uh, who's in Cape Town, so oh, okay. I'm, I'm kind of uh, fairly lucky from, from that perspective to, to be able to kind of live at home. Uh, the, the rest of the team is, is mostly in San Francisco. So there's an office there that's co-located with the uh, Watson West office, so the, the yep. Watson teams that are, that are sure. based there in, in, uh, in Howard Street, I think it is. How now. often do you get there? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be there next week. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I typically, uh, sort of two, two or three times a year, is, is, you know, I try and get across there and right. uh, you know, interface with the team. But so we are a fairly, I mean, IBM is, is a, obviously a global company and, and I've been surprised, actually pleasantly surprised, that you know, there are team members pretty much everywhere. Uh, our team has a few scattered around, including me, but uh, in general, when you interface with various teams, uh, you, they pop up in all kinds of geographic locations, and I think it's great, you know, the huge diversity of, uh, of, of people and, and locations. So. Anything, I mean, it's early days here, early day one, uh, any, but anything you saw in the morning keynotes or things you hope to learn here, anything that, that's excited you so far? Uh, I caught a, a couple of the, the, the morning keynotes, um, but I had to dash out to kind of prepare for, yeah, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a talk later actually on, uh, on uh, feature hashing for scalable machine learning. So that's at 12.20, please come and a, see. A, bre everybody. a breakout session, it's at what, 12.20? Uh, uh, 20 past 12, yeah. Okay. So uh, in, in room 302, I think. So okay. uh, I'll, I'll be talking about that, and uh, so I needed to prepare. Um, but yeah, I, I think so some of the key uh, exciting things that I've seen that I would like to go and take a look at uh, are, are, are kind of related to the, the deep learning on Spark. You know, I think that's been a, a, to a hot topic recently and, and one of the areas where, again, Spark is, is perhaps, um, you know, hasn't been the, you know, the strongest contender, let's say. But uh, there's some really interesting work coming out of Intel, it, it looks like. Uh, They're so going to be talking here on theCUBE in a couple hours. Yeah, and I'd really like to see, the, to see their work, and uh, yeah. that sounds very exciting. So, yeah, I mean, I think every time I come to a Spark Summit, um, there, are, there, there are all these new projects from the community, uh, you know, various companies, some of them big, some of them startups, that are you know, pushing the, the envelope, whether it's you know, uh, research projects in machine learning, whether it's you know, adding you know, deep learning libraries, whether it's improving performance for, you know, uh, for kind of commodity clusters or, or for single, uh, very powerful single nodes. You know, there's always uh, people pushing the envelope, um, you know, and that's what's great about being involved in an open source community project you know, and being part of this, this community. So yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the, the talks that I'd like to go and see. Um, and I think I unfortunately had to miss some of the Netflix talks on their recommendation pipelines. That's always interesting to see. So, right. But I'll have to catch them on the uh, on the video. <laughs> well, there's always another another project in open source land. Nick, thanks very much for coming on the cube and good luck. Cool. Thanks right, very much. Have a good trip. Have, have a good trip. Stay warm. All right, man. <laughs> All right, keep it right there, everybody. George and I will be back with our next guest. We're live. This is the cube from Spark Summit East. Hashtag Spark Summit. Be right back.